According to standard operating procedure, if an FAA flight controller notices anything that suggests a possible hijacking, the controller is to contact a superior. If the problem cannot be fixed within about a minute, the superior is to ask NORAD, the North American Aerospace Command, to send up or scramble jet fighters to find out what is going on. NORAD then issues a scramble order to the nearest Air Force base with fighters on alert. But although interceptions usually occur within 10 or so minutes, in this case, 80 or so minutes had elapsed before fighters were even airborne. It's a mind-bending anomaly. Not a single U.S. Air Force interceptor turns a wheel until it's too late. There are no jets at all. What if they were so confused and had been so deliberately confused that they couldn't respond? The reason that they didn't know where to go was because a number of conflicting and overlapping uh, war game exercises were taking place. It involved the insertion of false radar blips onto radar screens in the Northeast Air Defense Sector. Center Team U, we have a, a problem here. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New, New York. We need someone to scramble some S-16s or something up there to help us out. Is this, is this real world or exercise? Is this, is this real world or exercise? There was another exercise, Vigilant Warrior, which was in fact, according to a NORAD source, a live fly hijack drill being conducted at the same time. With only eight available fighter aircraft and they have to be dispatched in pairs, they were dealing with as many as 22 possible hijacks on the day of 9-11 and they couldn't separate the war game exercises from the actual hijacks. Page 172, the U.S. government has not been able to determine the origin of the money used for the 9-11 attacks. Ultimately, the question is of little practical significance. The American authorities have not managed to trace the source of the funding. And then the most amazingly disingenuous statement, ultimately, is it of little consequence. It is a massive consequence. Doesn't it matter who paid for 9-11? The collapse of Building 7 has been recognized as especially difficult to explain. The 9-11 Commission report implicitly admitted that it could not explain the collapse of this building by not even mentioning it. Mr. President, why are you and the Vice President insisting on appearing together before the 9-11 Commission? Because the 9-11 Commission, Commission wants to ask us questions. That's why we're meeting, and I look forward to meeting with them and answering their questions. Uh, why you're appearing together rather than separately, which was their request? Because it's a good chance for both of us to answer questions that the 9-11 Commission is uh, looking forward to asking us, and I'm looking forward to answering them. Let's see. Do you think they should be able to stand up and, and, and speak their own words? They should go under oath. They should be, yeah, in public. Don't you think that the families deserve to have a transcript or to be able to see what you Adam, said? Adam, you asked me that question yesterday. For an I got the today. same answer, yeah. The final report was a unanimous report. That means that if there was a single commissioner who had any objection about anything, that fact would be dropped from the report. We have found out that he not only served on the transition team of the Bush administration, that he was a person who wrote a draft memo for the setup of the Bush administration's National Security Council, that he was an individual who wrote the preemptive war strategy that was eventually used for the war in Iraq, that he is a close friend of Condoleezza Rice's. We want him to resign. So there is literally nothing in the 9-11 report that the Bush administration did not approve of. We can understand, therefore, why the Commission, under Zelikow's leadership, would have ignored all the evidence that would point to the truth, that 9-11 was a false flag operation intended to authorize the doctrines and funds needed for a new level of imperial mobilization.
armed with knives, armed with chemical, biological, nuclear weapons. Fanatics, terrorists, September 11th. September 11th, killers, September 11th, terrorists. Terrorists of Al-Qaeda, terrorists, nuclear weapons, terrorists. 9-11, terror, terror, terrorists, evil. September 11th, September 11th, the terrorists, war and danger. September 11th, terrorism, global terrorism, terrorism, terrorist, 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 the terror, terrorist, terrorist, terrorism. September 11th, global terrorism, terrorist, terror, terrorism, September 11th. World terrorism, terrorism, terrorism. September 11, global terrorism. September the 11th, terror, 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 terror. Weapons of mass destruction. September the 11th, September the 11th, terrorists, the evil terror, terrorists, terrorists, no. Terrorism. The words are hypnotically repeated. Terrorism, terrorist, terrorist threat, and of course, believed to be linked to Al Qaeda. But it's the so-called war on terrorism that's in our faces practically 24-7 as the inescapable focus of our existence. One day, our grandchildren will look back on this time and ask, how was the war on terror won? The entire U.S. ruling class, ruling elite, comes to see terrorism as the preferred means, indeed the only means, to provide social cohesion, to provide an enemy image for the society to keep it together. According to neocon theory from Carl Schmitt, you have to have an enemy image in order to have a society. A very dangerous thing because now it means that the entire social order, the political parties, intellectual life, politics in general, all based on a monstrous myth, monstrous myth. Look, the CIA has done in this country, what they've done to us is unbelievable. Look at the terrorist acts that have occurred. The CIA behind most, if not all of them. We had the Marine Barracks, we had our embassy in Kenya. We had Pan Am, 103. We had the USS Cole. Uh, we had Oklahoma City. We had the World Trade Center in 1993. That helped the terrorists blow up the World Trade Center the first time. They built the bomb. They, they got the driver's license. The informant, the informant, a fellow named Salam, a 43-year-old former Egyptian uh, army officer, he was given the assignment to put the bomb together. And he went to his supervisor, his FBI supervisor, and said, we're going to put a dummy bomb in here, right? He's, and the FBI supervisor said, no, we're going to put a real bomb. The FBI actually carried out the attack on the World Trade Center in 1993. They actually hired Ahmad Salam and paid him one million dollars and gave him real explosives, a detonator, and told him to build a bomb and to give it to the foolish people that he was controlling to allow them to attack the World Trade Center complex. Unfortunately for them, there were only six people killed, not enough to pass the legislation. So what happened is two years later, April 19, 1995, down comes Oklahoma City uh, Murrah building, 168 people killed. One year later, the anti-terrorism legislation that takes away many of our constitutional rights and civil liberties is passed. Because at half past nine this morning, we were actually running an exercise for a, over a, a company of a thousand people in London based on simultaneous bombs going off precisely at the railway stations that happened this morning. So I still have the hairs on the back of my neck standing upright. Did you get this quite straight? You were running uh, a, an exercise to see where, how you would cope with this, and it happened while you were running the exercise? Precisely.